I been asleep? And when had I realized that I wasn't anymore? I watched the ceiling fan circling slowly above me, doing nothing to dissipate the clouds of cigarette smoke that had drifted above my room for years. I started most mornings this way. But no, it wasn't morning, was it? I turned my head towards the bedroom window and confirmed the sky was dark outside of it. The last thing I recalled was being in the bathroom and then... Silence. And sweet darkness. Seth. I sat up and chugged an old bottle of water sitting on the floor next to the bed and then threw the empty bottle at my closet door. I lit a cigarette and took a long drag releasing a cloud of smoke up into the apathetic fan. It floated idly above me. Pulling on an old hoodie, I walked out into the small living room of the apartment I shared with my roommate. Evening, princess. Seth was reclined on the end of the couch, fingers flying across the keyboard of a notebook sitting on his lap. A confusing yet edgy indie movie played on the TV in front of him. This was pretty much Seth's life on any given day, and it's perfectly summed up in all of my interactions with him since I'd moved in. Well, all of my sober interactions with him anyway. I pulled down on my sleeves to subconsciously hide my arms, like it made any sort of difference. But of course it didn't. Seth already knew. He noticed what I was doing and his smile fell into a sobering look. Found you passed out in the bathroom again. Sorry, I rasped, and reached for a half can of Mountain Dew that had been sitting on the counter for God only knows how long. Did you realize how difficult it is for me to drag a six-foot-three dude out of the bathroom and down the hall to his room? Next time, just leave me there, man. Hardly. You would have choked on your own vomit. I shrugged. I knew this was the death lurking for me in the future. But heroin afforded me one convenience that I refused to part with. Sleepless dream. I'd die before I surrendered that. Besides, if the nightmares came back, I'd probably just kill myself anyway. You had some visitors today while you were passed out. Dreddy stopped by. Yeah? Yeah. He left you some more drugs. Said you could pay him when you had the money, you know? He must be the sweetest, most generous drug dealer in all of Chicago. Where is it? You were sleeping like a baby in the tub, so I just left it next to you, Seth said. Cool. In the toilet. Dude. Look, man, if you die, I don't get your half of the rent. And if I don't get your half of the rent... I have to get a real job. It's just business, not personal. Of course, it wasn't true. Seth and I had met at a darker time in both of our lives and shared the sort of bond that's only forged in such circumstances. Oh, who was the other? I asked. The other what? The other visitor. Ah, a girl, actually. I told her you were out, figured you'd prefer I tell her that over the truth. Did she say what she wanted? I asked. No. I swore. That was never good. It was probably just some girl coming over to beg for free drugs, which I didn't currently have because Seth had flushed them down the toilet and I would never let her touch my private stash. That has to be it. What the fuck else could she want? Great. So some chick either wants a hookup or is coming over to tell me she's pregnant. Seth scoffed. You wish. This chick was way beyond anything you could ever get. Really? Because she did come around asking for me, didn't she? Sure. But I'm the one who got her number. No, you fucking didn't. I laughed as I walked into the kitchen and took one of our three glasses out of the cupboard. Oh, I did. Seth held up a torn shard of white paper. She gave it to me and asked me to call her whenever you came home. He used air quotes in the last two words. Yeah, well, don't. I don't want anything to do with... There was a knock at the door. I shot Seth a poisonous look. What? He threw up his hands and stood up. She's really hot, and you can't stand in the way of true love. Don't open it. I warned as he walked over to the door. Sorry, Sam, but you know I have a thing for redheads. Redheads? What? Do I know any redheads? I couldn't place one for the life of me. And then Seth opened the door to reveal 
Kimber DeStaro, standing on the other side. I suddenly felt like a bucket of ice water had been dumped onto my soul. I had a few seconds to study her before her eyes found me leaning against the counter in the kitchen. She was still very short, but her hair was longer. Halfway down her back, it looked like. And she was, of course, almost ten years older than the last time I'd seen her. Looking at her after all these years was... physically crippling. I had to make a concentrated effort to stay on my feet while my knees tried to buckle underneath me. Just seeing her face brought back painful memories I thought long buried. She was like a mirage, long dead, returning to torture me. Kimber's eyes finally found me as she nervously clutched her cell phone in her hands, turning it over and over against her chest. Hi, Sam. She said with more confidence than she clearly felt. Since Kimber had actually spoken to me, I could probably confirm that this wasn't a nightmare. She was really here, and if she was real, that meant that it was all real, too. A shudder racked in my body, and I, I, I wound my white-knuckled fingers around the edge of the countertop. Why are you here? I hadn't meant to sound so angry. My words seemed to rattle Kimber, and she took a step back. I... Well, I... Seth watched the exchange with interest, but still didn't intervene. You shouldn't be here, Kimber, I said. I just wanted her to leave. This needed to end before I lost it. After she was gone, I could pretend she was just a nightmare seeping through the veil. Kimber hesitated. I saw her calculating in her mind as she watched me, her lips moving only slightly as she organized all the variables in her head. It was... It was such a Kimber thing to do, and it made me realize how much I missed her. I saw the exact moment Kimber found in her mind what she was looking for. Did you get my letter? She asked. Yes. And? And? I threw it away. Lies. She faltered only for a moment. Did you read it? I didn't say anything. But I knew she could read the answer on my face. When neither of us spoke, an awkward tension began to bleed into the room. So, I'm Seth, my roommate said, still casually leaning against the door. Kimber held my stare for a moment longer and then broke it to finally walk into the room. Seth let the door close behind her. Kimber, she said to him. And how do you know Sam? We grew up together. Neat! Sam and I were cellmates in prison. Seth! I snapped. I was in for super sexy felony computer crimes. Sam was in for, I swear to God, Seth, I warned. Harder stuff. <laughs> Good night, all, he said cheerfully and left the room. I kept my eyes on him as he made his way down the hall to his room, cursing his every step. When Seth's door had finally closed behind him, I reluctantly let my gaze drift back into the room. Kimber was watching me with an expression I couldn't read. I didn't like it. The letter? She repeated. Yes, I read it. Kimber continued to stare at me, waiting for more. She cracked me just that easily. Uh, I don't know what to say. I ran my hands through my mess of dark, unwashed hair. I'm sorry that we couldn't... That we didn't... Sam, stop. I'm not here for apologies. I don't need one. 
You guys got me out. Kyle got you out. His name seemed to impale her. I wonder how long it had been since she'd heard it. Well, that's kind of why I'm here. There are others, Sam. Women who never escaped that place. Yeah. I want to help them. How? I want Drisking to be exposed. I want what they've done to be known to the world. Yeah, so do I. So do a lot of people, but the majority of us aren't in a real position to do anything about it. I needed a drink. I pulled a plastic bottle of cheap vodka from the freezer and poured it into a glass. You want some? I asked. Almost as an afterthought. God, yes. And I took another glass down from the cupboard, filled it, and handed it to her. She drank half of it in one sip, which seemed to steady her. So, what do you want from me, Kimber? I asked as she set the glass down. I want you to come back to Drisking with me. <laughs> I laughed and tipped my glass back, allowing the hot sting of the alcohol to unfurl down my throat. I... <laughs> I'm serious, Sam. Yeah, the answer is no. We'd never leave that place alive. We did once. We're not going back. I have a contact. You know, some... Someone on the inside? The inside of what? Drisking? Baraska? The sheriff's office? They know stuff, okay? They're willing to help us. That's all we need to know. No. We need a lot more information than that, and- And you'll get it. Later. After we get there. Did you really come all this way from California to ask me this? After nine years. Actually, I wasn't asking. Kimber looked at me coolly and crossed her arms in front of her with ironclad conviction. This wasn't the Kimber I remembered. I didn't know this woman. So somebody told you that they were going to help you take down a very highly connected and protected crime syndicate, and you believed them. I didn't say that. So you, you don't trust them? I didn't say that either. Yeah, well, this isn't happening. We'll be dead the minute we cross the county line. Are you saying you won't go? Fuck no, I won't go, I said, pouring myself more vodka. All right, Kimber said and set her glass on the table beside me. Well, thank you for the drink, but I have to go. Something lurched inside me. I couldn't let her leave. Not when I had just gotten her back. So why was I being such a dick? Wait. I took a step toward her before I realized what I'd done. Where are you going? I told you, she snapped as she started towards the door. I'm going to Drisk. I was on her before she finished her sentence and yanked her away from the door. The hell you are! I told you I was going, Sam, and I fucking meant it! I didn't know you intended to go alone. That's goddamn suicide. I don't care. It needs to end. Why... Why does it have to be you? I pleaded desperately. My heart began to sink as I realized I did know this Kimber. Her mind was made up. And there'd be no stopping her. Who else, Sam? Who else but us? There's no one else. I thought of my best friend back at that place. Seared through my brain like a hot iron. I had to make Kimber see reason, even if I had to hurt her. There was no other way. So after what Killian Celery did to you there... After all you suffered at Baraska, you want to go back? She snatched her arm back from my grasp. Yes. Because there are other people still suffering as we stand here arguing about this. We shouldn't have even waited this long to try and help them. No, wait. We can think this through. I'll try again with the FBI, the cops, Interpol. I don't know. Whoever will listen. Did that work before? She asked. It hadn't. Sam, if I try to report this... What happened to me? 
I'll show up on the radar immediately and be dead by morning. No more pretensions, no more manipulations. I had to bare my soul to this girl if I wanted to stop her. Please, I said desperately, please, Kimber. I'm begging you not to make me do this. I'm sorry, but I'm going. I was panicking, unable to control my breath for the pounding in my heart, which was racing to a finish line that lay somewhere in the immediate future. Fuck! I screamed and swept Kimber's vodka glass off the table to where it shattered against the wall. This didn't seem to surprise her, and Kimber kept her composure while I raged. Fuck! It was over. I was going. To Drisking. I watched the vodka drip down the wall where I'd hurled it. If I wasn't so terrified, I would have been embarrassed by my outburst, but I couldn't stop the shaking. Deep breaths. One problem at a time, I needed to wipe off the wall, pick up the glass, and then I could go die in Missouri. I let out a pathetic sigh. Sam, I won't let anything happen to you. I gave her a ludicrous look. How could such a tiny person stop anything from happening to me? Kimber had always been a little fireball, but this was madness. She raised her chin defiantly when she saw me assessing her. When are we leaving? I asked, trying to keep my voice as composed as possible. All I wanted to do was retreat into my room where I could let the fear overtake me. In the morning. That's fucking crazy, Kimber. We need time to plan, and I need to... I need the contact number for the source of yours. We can't just go waltzing into town after a decade. I've had a lot of time to prepare for this. Years, in fact. Look, tomorrow, let's just get in the car and go, and I'll... I'll have the entire eight-hour drive to convince you that I have a good plan. What the fuck is the rush, Kimber? You trying to be dead by Christmas? Just trust me. I'll explain everything in the car tomorrow. You know it's already midnight. Yeah, I know. I've been driving all day. I'm tired as hell. She sighed. You just got in today. Yes. From L.A. Close enough? Jesus Christ, woman. Do you have a hotel? Not yet. She shrugged. <sighs> you can stay here then. With you talking so much crazy, I... Uh, I don't trust your lunacy out there in the city. Kimber narrowed her eyes at me, then shrugged. Fine by me. Okay, you can take my room. Give me a minute. Shattered whiskey glass forgotten, I left Kimber standing where she was and went back to my room. I flipped the light on and glanced around. My heart plummeted. The room was disgusting. I hadn't really looked at it in years. It's really just a place to watch TV or pass out. I couldn't remember the last time I had changed the sheets or done any laundry. The girls who usually stayed over didn't care much what they were sleeping on. But this was no place for a girl like Kimber. I stripped the bed as fast as I could and herded bottles, discarded needles, and empty cigarette boxes into the closet. I realized too late that I didn't actually have anything to replace the dirty sheets. I was so overwhelmed by the last 40 minutes that I felt tears start to well up in my eyes. Get a hold of yourself, you pussy. I jumped at a sudden knock at the door. Seth stuck his head in. Here. He handed me a stack of clean, folded sheets on top of a blue quilt. I wanted to hug him, but I was still attempting to get my emotions under control. Thanks. Hey, so, listen, he said slowly. Does this mean, I mean, is all that stuff about drisking true? I never told Seth, or anyone else besides the feds, anything about drisking. What stuff? Oh, come on, man. I heard you talking in your sleep all the time. You say all sorts of fucked up stuff. That's why I'd, I heard your friend's name before. You talked about her in your sleep. What are you talking about? I said, I don't even dream when I sleep. Yeah, you do. You may not remember it, but trust me, you do. I didn't say anything. And Seth started to leave. Oh, one more thing. If you need anything while you're back home, just call me. Home. Fucking Drisking was home. 
Since I lived in a shitty neighborhood, I walked Kimber down to her car to get her bag out of the back seat. She dropped her duffel bag on that thankfully dark carpet of my freshly cleaned room, which was still barely passable. At the very least, I'd know she was here and safe. I had always wondered if Clary or Prescott were having me watched. They were. Kimber was in danger by just being in Chicago. It possibly was a good idea to leave in the morning. I settled down on the couch and pulled out my personal stash, which I'd pocketed while kicking garbage in my closet earlier. I needed it tonight, of all nights. And if it was going to be one of my last, then... I'd make it count. Thirty minutes later... I floated down the familiar river of dark... Dreamless sleep. I didn't remember dreaming. But I knew I had. I woke up feeling like I had run 30 miles, drenched in sweat and fighting to draw in air with raw, ragged breaths. I sat up on the couch and rubbed my face. What time was it? Why was I in the living room? Why did I feel a malicious black cloud limbing over me like some sort of comic strip character and then it all came back crashing like waves over my head holy shit Kimber was here and she and she wanted something I felt the fear shower me like like cold ice rain as I recalled pieces of the night before who were going back Kimber's bag was next to the door she was sitting at the table reading one of Seth's look how smart I am philosophy books As I sat up and I slid the evidence of my addiction under the couch with my foot, praying she hadn't already seen it. Morning, Sam, Kimber said, smiling without looking up from the book. Why the fuck are you so chipper? You remember where we were going, right? Yes. He put the book down and looked over at me, beaming. (laughs) I've just missed you so much. It was a genuine statement. And my mouth twitched into a little smile at her words. God damn it, I was happy to see her too. Buried underneath all the fear and numbing pain was a glowing euphoria. I had never been happier than when I was with Kimber and Kyle and one of them had actually come back from the void of the past. I stood up. Just let me shower and pack and then we can get on the road. That is, if you're still planning on going. Yes, I am, she said. Are you? Yeah. Yeah, it appears that I am. I had run out of arguments. Seth had already left for the day, so I locked the apartment, and we headed down to Kimber's car. A ten-year-old Mazda sedan. She took my bag and threw it into the back seat next to hers, then climbed in. So, eight hours, huh? I asked as she started the engine. Yep, but I can probably do it in seven. Fuck me, don't rush on my account. Kimber pulled her sunglasses down and pulled out of the apartment complex. I looked back and wondered... If I'd ever see that crumbling, graffiti-covered wall ever again. Or if I'd even want to. Stop staring at me. What? You're not as sly as you think you are. Sorry, it's just... I thought I'd never see you again. Neither did I. You look good. And pretty. You know, like, healthy. Kimber raised an eyebrow. Thanks? I think. I laughed nervously. (laughs) You know what I mean. You you look like you've done well for yourself the past ten years. Kimber frowned and remained quiet for a minute, as if debating whether to tell me something. I never told anyone where I came from, she finally said. My mom said that she had family in Anaheim, but I couldn't find them. Everyone thought I was just a runaway. Cops picked me up almost immediately, put me in a halfway house. Sorry about your car, by the way. They impounded it. I don't suppose you ever got it back. I shrugged. No, but who cares? I was just an old Honda. Kimber threw me a sympathetic look. I'm sorry. Anyway, the halfway house kept trying to identify me, so I ran away from there, too. Eventually, I got a job. Southern California is a great place to live if you don't have an ID, by the way. I'm sure. After that, I went to community college, and yeah, I've... It's been sort of biting my time. 
Are you sure you want to just throw all that away to expose your rapist? Kimber winced at my words, and I immediately regretted them. No. Him I want dead. And throw all what away? I've been planning this for an entire decade. Well, you've still done better than me. I'm a... Uh, I have a... Uh, I'm a mess. Were you really in prison? Yeah. Yeah. She didn't say anything. Felony possession. I'm... I volunteered. Kimber nodded. And you're still... I knew what she was asking. Yes, I said. So, what's your plan? Well, first we're going to rent a room just outside of town. Remember that one motel off exit 113? Price Ridge Inn or something. Outside of town, I like it. Then I'm going to meet with my contact sometime tomorrow. Right. Then we just go from there. Go from there? Yeah. Kimber nodded, but wouldn't look at me. Please, don't tell me this is your plan. Our contact would give us more direction. Your contact? Yeah. Do I know this guy? I asked. I didn't say it was a guy. And it doesn't matter. Why wouldn't it matter? Because this person has told me stuff that can only mean that they're on our side. Yeah, like what? Like the sheriff's schedule. My dad. Yeah. He's... He's Sheriff of Drisking. I hadn't doubted that. What else? Okay, well... They also told me that they know where all the records are. What records? You know, all the data for the Baraska operation. The incriminating stuff. Alright. And, well... Um... They told me things about Kyle. Yeah? I can tell you things about Kyle, too. Sam... Kyle's gone. No, he isn't. No? Actually, yeah, because I saw him with my own eyes before I left town. I talked to him, too. He's empty, Kimber. There's no one in there. You're wrong! He's a total vegetable. You're wrong! That's wrong! My source told me that he's just sedated. Sedated? Sedated? Sedated for nine years, Kimber. Yes. She said with false conviction. So your source is just telling you things you want to hear. I believe it's true. Kimber, I saw what they did to Kyle. They straight up beat the death into him. The only part of Kyle that's left on Earth is his mangled body. Stop, Sam. I'm sorry. I just... I can't go through this again. Not with Kyle. I've already mourned him and you should too. We need to know for sure. Hold up. Wait. Is... So this little trip isn't actually about getting the records or killing the asshole who hurt you or, or helping those people. This is, this is some sort of ill-conceived rescue mission, isn't it? Partially. So that's your rush then. You got some, some bad info that Kyle is alive and you're running off half-cocked to get him. No. Why don't we just, just go straight into his house, pick him up then, huh? We can be back on the road by dawn. I don't know where he is. The Landys moved him. Then what are we doing? If I'm gonna die for this, Kimber. I deserve to know why. She jerked the wheel to the side of the highway and slammed on her brakes. Fuck, Kimber! I yelled. My head cracked against the window as I was still seeing stars when I realized that Kimber was out of the car. I rubbed my head until the throbbing stopped and followed her to the back where she was standing over the open trunk. Inside were dozens of guns. At least 30 of them. There were rifles, handguns, a shotgun. There were boxes upon boxes of ammunition. Are you planning to storm the Alamo? Does this look like Kyle is all I'm after? I'm actually a little scared of you right now. I want all of this to end. I want Kyle back, yes. And it's true. That's why I showed up so suddenly. But I want more than that, Sam. I want him dead. I understood her hatred for Clary. But if we were going to murder people, I wanted Jimmy Prescott dead as well. When the time came, and if I was certain he was culpable, my father too. How did you get all these? Kimber shrugged. 
It's taken me a few years. Lots of traveling around the Southwest to gun shows and stuff. Okay. We'll close the trunk before somebody drive by sees your fucking arsenal. This is Illinois for fuck's sake. She slammed it shut and we got back into the car where I started rubbing my head and lamenting at the bump that was already forming there. When I realized Kimber hadn't started the car, I looked up to find her gripping the steering wheel tightly and staring straight out of the windshield. She was fighting back tears. Kimber, I'm sorry, I said. She blinked a few times to clear her eyes. I'm being a total asshole. I don't know what's wrong with me. But I did know. My mind was cloudy from years of drug use. I had no filter. I had problems controlling my emotions, which swung back and forth like the pendulum on a clock and changed just as often. No, I... I never should have asked you to come. It was wrong. She breathed the last words and she dropped her hands from the steering wheel. Asked, I said. She covered her face. You're right. I manipulated you. You you don't even know me anymore. You shouldn't be here. I leaned over the center console and hugged her. Kimber recoiled at my touch like I'd, like I'd delivered an electric shock. Shit. I'm sorry, I said. No, it, it's okay. I just... I don't like to be touched. This was new Kimber. I pulled out my pack of Marlboros and lit a cigarette without asking if it was okay. Fuck, Kimber, I'm a piece of shit. And I've, all, I've always been a piece of shit. I'll probably always be here, honestly. You've given the opportunity to do something with my life, but I'm fucking scared and it makes me a dick. Kimber leaned back and wiped her eyes. You really don't have that much to worry about, Sam. You're still the son of the sheriff, and he won't hurt you. I considered this, too. It made my skin crawl. Son of the sheriff. If what I expected was true, that makes me heir to Baraska. My stomach lurched in revulsion. Maybe. Let's just get to the hotel and we'll decide what to do. We probably want to make as little noise as possible when we figure out where Clary and Prescott are. We don't want anyone to know we're back in town. Kimber nodded. And the sheriff. And the sheriff. I didn't want to think about it. I had buried the assumptions about my father's guilt years ago. I know enough black tar heroin to kill a horse. I guess... I guess it was time to remember. We spent the rest of the drive avoiding the topic of drisking. We talked about people we knew, movies we'd seen. Hell, we even made a few jokes that didn't fall totally flat. It reminded me of those days we were still in my car in the drisking high parking lot, listening to music, getting stoned. It made me miss Kyle and weed. I'd given it up for the harder stuff years ago. Or to put it more eloquently, if pot were a gateway drug, I'd left it at the gate. The closer we got to Drisking, the quieter the car became, and by the time we hit the Missouri border, we were in complete silence. I stared out the window until the dread of familiar things passing by made me look away. We were almost there. Kimber pulled into the Prince Ridge within an hour and got out to check us in. I stayed in the car, eyeing the other vehicles in the parking lot. Nothing I recognized, but seeing as how it had been almost a decade since I'd been home, I wasn't sure what mattered. The first exit for Drisking. And there were only the two. It was only four miles down the highway. If Kimber considered this safe... And there was no reason to worry, right? She'd always been the smart one. I jumped as Kimber jerked the car door open and she got in. She noticed. You know, I'm traveling with you, right? I rolled my eyes. Pardon me for being a little on edge. 209, she said, pointing up to the second floor. I'll drive around. 
You look for it. The room was at the front of the property facing the highway. I brought our bags upstairs and then stood shivering outside in the cold while I smoked a cigarette. When I finished, I flicked the cigarette over the railing and watched it fall into the bed of a maroon Dodge Ram. Oops. I followed Kimber inside and was relieved to see that there were two beds and three locks on the door. So far, not a complete disaster. Since it was around six, Kimber wanted to go grab some dinner. Fairtoli, Christians, she suggested. They're both only a few miles away. Uh, no. Prescott artesian sandwiches, then? She winked at me. No, I said, ignoring her joke. I mean, we shouldn't leave. We should order delivery or something. Kimber's casual smile fell off of her face. You're worried for no reason. And you're homesick. Kimber's eyes slid to the floor and she sat down on the edge of the bed. Probably. I just... I think we need to lay low as much as possible right now. No, you're right, Kimber said, and tucked her feet underneath her. She turned to watch the snow fall through the window. I rubbed my temples as an ache began to ebb in, like the tide around my eyeballs. I needed a fix. Soon. It doesn't snow in Riverside, where I live. I miss the snow. Moved to Chicago. I said in between deep, measured breaths. It snows five months out of the year. Kimball was silent, and I prayed she was studying a menu. The sooner she got on the phone for delivery, the sooner I could excuse myself to the bathroom and take the edge off. I miss Kyle. I looked up to see Kimber still watching the snow. Her head leaning against the wall. Me too. I said after a minute. Her eyes snapped to mine as if she'd forgotten I was there. You look hungry. I'll order pizza from Domino's. I remember what you like on it. She said before glancing at a menu next to her on the nightstand. She picked up the phone and began dialing the number. I got up to use the bathroom and took my entire duffel bag with me. If Kimber noticed. She didn't say anything. I forced a slice of pizza down for Kimber's sake. Um, so, tomorrow, I said, taking the bed nearest the door. What time are we meeting this person? Um, well, uh, well, it's just going to be me this time. Yeah, Kimber, there's no way I'm letting you meet with some random drisking fuckwit by yourself. I have to go alone or they won't talk to me. Who the fuck is this guy, Kimber? I can't tell you that yet. Is it a woman or a man? I asked. She shook her head at me. And just what is he giving you tomorrow? The file on Baraska? No. Then what? I... I don't know. I... I don't actually know. Kimber, this is crazy. I have... I can't let you go into town alone. Sam... Stop being in such a fucking hurry to die! I snapped at her. Kimber's face paled and she moved further away from me on her bed. We'll talk about it in the morning, she whispered, then turned off the lamp. Fine. I laid in the dark for a while. When I was sure she was asleep, I went back into the bathroom for another hit. By the time I woke up the next morning, Kimber was gone. I called Kimber 34 times in five minutes. It was 10 in the morning and I hadn't heard her leave, hadn't even woken up when she did. I cursed her and my dope in the same breath. If she didn't answer soon, I'd be forced to walk the three and a half miles to downtown Drisking and start asking around for her. A course of action that would be getting me noticed real fucking quick. I paced the patio for half an hour and smoked cigarette after cigarette, thankful I'd packed an entire carton. 
Just as I was pulling on my boots to leave, my phone rang. I was relieved to see Kimber's number pop up, a new addition to my phone book that would have unfurled a comforting warmth in my stomach, if I wasn't so irate. I answered, what the fuck, Kimber? I'm sorry, I'm sorry Sam, I had to. He wasn't going to meet me otherwise. Where are you? I'm in my car. I'm almost back. They haven't... They haven't plowed yet in town. Really? In bucolic, perfect little drisking, they haven't even plowed the roads by ten on a Friday morning? I thought it was weird too. There's more. I'll tell you when I get there. Don't get off the phone with me until you pull into the parking lot. Okay. I opened the door and went to wait outside in the cold for Kimber's car. My heart didn't slow to a normal rate until I finally saw it driving into the parking lot. She pulled into the space below our door and ran up the stairs. I'm sorry. I'm sorry I had to. Don't be mad. You fucking kidding with me? Are you fucking kidding with me, Kimber? I'm already on edge. I can, I can barely fucking breathe. Okay, okay, just sit down. She pushed me into the room and sat down on the edge of the bed, pulling off her gloves. And she crouched in front of me and took me by the shoulders, looking me in the eyes. The sheriff and most of his deputies are engaged today, which I was told means that they're up at Baraska. And? And that means that A, they don't know that we're here, and B, we can go into town and start discreetly looking around. As opposed to driving up to Baraska and killing them now? Kimber stood up. I want them dead, Sam, more than anything, but you know what else I want? I want their crimes to be known to the world. They don't get to die with their good names. They don't get to be martyrs. You want the records, I said. Yes. What do you plan on doing with them if you get them? Upload them onto the internet or something. Send them to the FBI. The FBI doesn't care. We need the records, Sam. I want everyone to know what happened to us. Kimber's voice had risen an octave, and she seemed to be on the verge of an anxiety attack. Okay, okay. I stood up. Maybe Seth can help. Your roommate? How? She asked. He does some pretty illegal stuff online. Maybe he can break into a mainframe or whatever and download the files. So he's a hacker? He yells at me when I call him that. Is he any good? I shrugged. He's well known in certain circles. She nodded. Well, we need those files. I just need to find out where they keep them. Are we sure they even really keep records on Baraska? Seems like a huge liability. An operation that size has to have records, and my source told me they exist. Great, your source. I rolled my eyes. Okay, so you want to go into town and what? Ask around about them? Kimber narrowed her eyes. That's idiotic. I was thinking more, maybe we find out where the Clary house is and, like, get the information out of Grace Clary. I raised my eyebrows at her. You want to torture an old lady? Kimber fucking exploded. An old lady that helped to rape, torture, and murder hundreds of women over 50 years? Fuck yeah, I want to torture that old lady. All right. All right. Look, I may know someone who might be sympathetic. And I'm reasonable, sure, that unlike your contact, she's innocent of any knowledge of Baraska. In fact, she's the one who helped me and Kyle find you. At the very least, she'll know where the Clarys live now. The drive into town took twice as long as it should have due to the snow. Why haven't they plowed these roads? I asked idly. It's not just the roads, it's everything. Kimber said grimly. A lot of stores have closed in town. Buildings are in disrepair, everything looks like shit. They don't even have any Christmas lights up. It's bizarre. It's fucking weird. Are we even sure the Baraska's still running? The town looks pretty... Destitute. I am, Kimber said and pointed to a billboard in the corner of Second and Osborne, which had six different and seemingly recent missing persons posters. What the fuck is going on? I murmured. As we turned on Main and onto the downtown marketplace, everything in town was as Kimber had described run down, ostensibly poor. 
what happened to this place. I don't know, but lucky for us, the antique shop is still in business, Kimber said, pointing across the road, and as we parked, I zipped my parka up to my neck and lowered my hat down to my eyes. Kimber did the same. The most important thing right now is not being recognized. Mr. Dranger was still behind the antique counter after all these years, but gone was his air of haughtiness and pretentious stare. He regarded us coolly, but professionally, until it was clear that we were only traveling through his shop to get to Catherine Scanlon's office at the back. He mumbled something under his breath and thought I didn't catch it. I was reasonably sure that there was no sign of recognition in his voice, nor his words. When we arrived at the office door of the Historic Preservation Society of Drisking, I knocked softly and listened for Catherine's voice. Instead, the door was yanked violently open by a man I'd never seen before. May I help you? He asked, as he eyed us up and down. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you can, I said. All right, then, come on in. I'm Don Wheeler, and you are? Kimber and I exchanged a careful look, then entered the room cautiously. Actually, we're looking for Catherine Scanlon, he said. I didn't like the way that he was staring at Kimber. Oh, Miss Scanlon, he said, not taking his eyes from her. You haven't heard? My stomach wrenched. We haven't, Kimber said, pulling her jacket around her more tightly. Disappeared, oh, nine years ago now, ten? Most people assume she didn't take Wyatt's death well and just walked out into the woods to... Don Wheeler suddenly looked up and seemed to remember his audience. Oh, I'm so sorry. Were you all friends? I ignored the question and asked one of my own. Did she ever surface again? Maybe in another state? No, I'm afraid she's dead. Mr. Wheeler shook his head. She's such a young thing, too. And her... remains? Kimber asked. Nothing was ever found, I'm afraid. I was starting to feel ill. Well then, uh, we'd better... Do you happen to know where the Clarys live? Kimber interrupted. A Grace and Killian. Of course. Old friends of mine. Fuck. But you must have heard. Thank you for your time. We really have to go. Come on, Allison. I yanked Kimber out of the room and shut the door behind us. Before I could get a harsh word out, I had fallen against the wall trying to quell up the building panic and nausea. He knew. I'm sorry. I, I shouldn't have asked, Kimber said quickly. I just thought that maybe... I held up a finger as I leaned against the wall with my head between my knees trying to compose myself. Kimber rubbed my back as I swallowed down the bile and waited for the dizziness to pass finally. Finally, I stood up. We have to go. I didn't even look at Dranger as we made our way out of the shop, but I could feel him watching us, my mind briefly wandering into the past as I wondered where his daughter was now. I never liked Phoebe. I had hoped she'd escape the town. Prayed she had. The streets had been busier than they had been several minutes before we'd entered the antique shop. There were several dozen people trudging through the snow down Main. I wasn't sure where they were heading since half the stores were closed up and the city hadn't bothered to put up their tree this year. Kimber walked around in the driver's side door of the car. I stared over her head at the people walking by across the street. I hoped my height, beard, and skeleton-like frame disguised me well enough because people were starting to look back. I almost hoped one of them was Clary, Prescott the fucking sheriff. We had a trunk full of guns, and I wanted this all over with. I needed to go back to the motel and bury myself in smack, and this time I didn't even want to wake up again. And then suddenly, just as Kimber sat down in the driver's seat, I did recognize someone. It was Mira Creedy and she was holding a little boy's hand. And as I stared, I realized who that little boy was. And then I saw nothing but red. <laughs>